Hi guys, Olive here, here today to dig deep into The Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton, or more specifically, to look into the psychology of the character of Undine Sprague. Believe it or not, the great Edith Wharton really did name a heroine, or should we say anti-heroine, Undine Sprague, in what seems to have been a preemptive punishment. Yeah, if your main character can be and is slapped with the nickname Undie, you might hate her, Edith Wharton might hate her, and you probably will too when you read the book because, well, she's kind of awful. When we first meet her, Undine is an Auburn beauty on the prowl. Her family is originally from a city called Apex, which we're told is somewhere in the Midwest, but we're never given a specific state where it is. But as Edith Wharton tells us, Undine was too big for the place. And by that she means that Undine wants more than what her hometown can provide. For her, Apex is not the Apex. I am positive that naming was intentional. She somehow convinces her parents to move to swankier and swankier cities, starting to put the pressure on them every time she begins to outgrow the place, with her ultimate sight set on, where else? New York City. But once she gets there, she knows she still has work to do because she's trying to be someone in New York society. She's trying to get established established, get herself in with the right crowd so as to elevate her social standing. Her mecca is Fifth Avenue, and she's willing to claw her way there if she has to. But also when we first meet Undine, we get the impression that as self-absorbed as she is, she actually has no idea who she is. Wharton describes her at one point as being fiercely independent, but passionately imitative, meaning that she's trying on personas like their new gowns that she's buying. It's a very typical thing for young people to do. In company, she's fidgety. She's very concerned with what everyone in the room is thinking about her, even though they're probably not thinking about her. And she also melts at compliments. To me, a lot of these things are synonymous with youth. But I think that's an important thing to note about Undine at this point in the story. She is young and she is impressionable. But also at this point, beyond being told that Undine has bullied her parents into relocating several times over, we also find out that Undine and her mother have both pretty much gotten whatever they want from Undine's father, Mr. Sprague, the one who makes all the money. We're told that he's put up a struggle several times in the past, but every time he has done so, the two ladies have supposed that he had an imperfect understanding of what constituted the necessities of life, and so they kept pestering him until they eventually got what they wanted. Undine wants the best of everything, and she's also easily bored. So she hops from lily pad to lily pad, from desire to desire, from interest to interest, expecting money for all of it. And she most frequently gets that. Most of the time, these things that Undine is asking for, she believes to be in service of her end goal, which is, of course, to make it in New York society. But as Wharton tells us, somewhat in this book, but definitely in other books, New York high society is something that you're either born into or you marry into. Undine doesn't have the option of being born into this society, so she'll have to marry into it. She will need to marry the right kind of man, preferably one who's excessively wealthy, in order to get where she wants in life. Undine is a very pretty girl, so she doesn't have any trouble attracting attention from men. And it's precisely that fact, not the fact that she's pretty, the fact that she attracts attention from a lot of men, that most attracts a different man, a Mr. Ralph Marvel, a very good man who seems to be very concerned that some some of his less reputable peers will attempt to corrupt her. He's unmarried and he starts to pursue Undine. Undine doesn't particularly like him, but he is from a good family. He checks off one of her boxes and so she agrees to marry him. This is the point where things begin to veer off the rails because notice how I said that Ralph checks off one of Undine's boxes, that he's from a good family. He has a good family name. What Ralph doesn't have is a whole lot of money. And Undine believes that the money a man brings in is a tribute to a woman's merits. And Ralph isn't paying much tribute. Ralph feels legitimately bad that he's not raking in the dough. He tries to do things to earn more. He wants to please his wife. But he starts to understand that she's obsessed with obtaining admiration. And she thinks that it's something that she can purchase. Ralph does believe, though, that it's something that she'll eventually outgrow. She'll start to focus on what's really important in life, like 
the child they have together. The child that Undy, not for one second, acts like she wants. The baby is at best a hitch in her plans, and she's officially bored of Ralph. And we all know what she does when she feels she's wrung all she can out of an experience. Even Ralph, in his own words, eventually recognizes that Undine has a cold tenacity to get what she wants. I've now shared all the pieces of the plot with you that I feel are necessary for you to understand as I break down what I saw in this novel. I do want to leave some things for you to experience in case you haven't read this book before. I've certainly shared enough by this point for you to be feeling some kind of a way about Undine. I doubt your feelings are very positive. And who could blame you? She's awful. But do you know who I dislike the most in this book? Undine's father. Mr. Abner Sprague provided for his family. That much is very clear. But by never saying no, by never letting his daughter or even his wife know the family's true financial position, he made monsters out of them. There's a side character you meet later on in the book who at one point is waxing philosophical about how men in society don't communicate with the women in their lives. They don't share the details of their lives with their wives or their daughters. They don't talk about how they go about earning their living. They don't talk about the type of financial situation the family is in unless things go into dire straits. And oppositely, they don't even take an interest in what the women are doing. They just finance the women's lifestyles as, quote, a bribe she's paid to keep out of some man's way. In this world, we know what we're taught. Undine and her mother are taught every single time that Mr. Sprague capitulates, every time he collapses under pressure and just buys that new gown. Or think about how crazy this is. Picks up his life and moves everything to a new city because his daughter is bored he teaches them that there are no boundaries, that the checkbook has no bottom. He teaches them, or teaches Undine, his child, that if she pushes hard enough, she will get whatever she wants. It just breeds entitlement. At one point in the book, Undine thinks to herself, she had a right to the money, and she was an ardent believer in rights. So at this point, I have a couple of questions for you. The first is, how is Undine to know anything about the world when she's not been taught anything about the world, especially not the financial world. And the second thing is, how is she to expect anything but endless amounts of money when everything she has ever asked for has been given to her? She is Veruca Salt. And who do we blame when the kid is a brat? pampered and spoiled like a Siamese cat. The point is that by not being taught the value of money, by not being taught to not wrap up all your worth in material things by her father, because it's the custom of the country to not involve women in financial matters, Undine Sprague is a result of the system. Edith Wharton has this uncanny ability to identify the kinks in the social system around her. And in her books, it seems like she zooms in on one of them. She isolates one of them and imagines what kind of a person and what kind of situations would arise out of the most extreme example of this ingrained societal flaw. In this book, it seems like Edith Wharton is looking at this tendency of men to keep women at arm's length, to not expose them to the realities of the world, especially regarding finances, and she's looking at all of this material wealth. It seems like for the length of this book, she is asking the question, what kind of a person is this world building? Well, certainly a materialistic one, one who values things over people or relationships, and one who has no self-restraint. They've never been told no, they have no boundaries, they're ruthless, and they're completely self-involved. Unfortunately, Undine goes on to marry someone who seems to have been most attracted to her based on a hero complex, which appears noble on the surface, but is ultimately extremely self-serving. He first wants to rescue her from corrupting influences and then provide her with a good life, which, once again, it means that he's not being real with her when it comes to their finances. Like her father did her entire upbringing, Ralph indulges Undine, but in a slightly different way. He doesn't tell her that he can see through her lies. He doesn't hold her accountable for her actions. And worst of all, he begins to pity her for the way she is, which is just about the worst thing you can do with someone like that. He at one point thinks to himself that Undine was what the gods had made her a creature of skin-deep reactions, a moat 
in the beam of pleasure. This is where I come in because no, no, Ralph, people aren't born that way. They're made. It irritated me in this book and it irritates me to no end in real life when I hear people talking about problems with their friends, their family, or their kids. And they say something like, well, you know, she's just so headstrong. She's gonna do whatever she wants to do. There's just nothing I can do about it. Loving someone means sometimes saying no. It means letting them know what's going on, respecting them enough to let them know what's going on. It means setting boundaries, and it certainly means getting in there when they're doing something dumb. The lazy thing is to give someone, especially your child, everything they want. It's lazy not to let someone know what's really going on. This is what what it results in. I'm not letting Undine off the hook here because we are all ultimately responsible for ourselves, our decisions, and our neuroses. But it makes me really sad seeing the way that life was set up for her. Much to Ralph's dismay, we find out that she's the kind of person who will never be satisfied. And what is life like when you're never satisfied? I'm pretty sure that like most of us, you have that one thing that if you get it, you think you'll finally be happy, you'll finally be satisfied. If I could just find the right partner, if I could just get the right job, if I could just have a little bit more money in my bank account, or if I could lose those 10 pounds then, then I would be satisfied, I would be happy. But as we all know, if you're fortunate enough to get that thing, all you do is raise the bar higher. And that's Undine's life, but on crack. She thinks normal, everyday life is monotonous. Even when she's in a peaceful state, she wants more, more, more. Because in her world, things don't have a deep meaning. Both things and people, to her, are disposable. She's never been taught that they have inherent value. She's never been taught to be content. And as such, she will always be unsettled, never sated. Before I read this, I heard from many people that the ending to this book is Undine's Just Desserts, but I found it to be more evidence that Undine is a tragic character, an example of the worst kind of a person, that this kind of withholding yet obliging and completely materialistic system generates. Call her the Sisyphus of New York society. So those were my thoughts on The Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton, more specifically my thoughts on Undine and why she is the way she is. I would love to hear from you in the comment section below what you thought about anything I talked about in this video or about anything in general, but if you'd prefer to chat somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media, and the links to all of those profiles will be in the description box below. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye. Mm -hmm.